Hey, I got him. Hello and welcome to episode 116 of the Chills of Will podcast. Kind of stunned and surprised in a great way to be able to talk to such a great person across from me here on Zoom. This is Noel, as he says, no, no umlaut, Noel Kassler. He is a New York City-based stand-up comedian. He's appeared in People Magazine, Newsweek, on Sirius XM, and in clubs across the country. His comedy draws on his over 25 years experience working behind the scenes in live tele television and the music industry including working directly with the Trump family for six seasons on Celebrity Apprentice. He's become an outspoken critic of the Trump administration. Noel, like I said, thanks so much for joining me today. How are you? Thanks, Peter. It's, it's a, I'm good, man. It's a pleasure to be here. You know, I'm in a country that doesn't have bombs falling on it right now, you know? Exactly. Right. So it's like, if ever there's a time to be grateful for what you have, it's now. That's for dang sure, man. You talk about, uh, you know, in your bio talks about 25 years of experience. It sounds like you got going really early in the entertainment industry. I'll get to that cool story in a minute. Just growing up, I mean, you grew up, you grew up East Coast. You grew up a little bit around the country, maybe. Like, were you, I mean, were you like a comedy nerd? Were you a reader? Were you a, a, a jock? Like, what were you into as a kid? Yeah, I was, you know, I had a single mom who was like a hippie. My parents had me when they were 19 years old and they named me after Jimi Hendrix's bass player. If that Aww. gives you any idea okay. what my childhood was like, you know? <laughs> so I'd spend kind of summers, they divorced when I was like four, you know, and I lived with my mom most of the year, kind of on the wrong side of the tracks outside of DC, Washington, DC. Uh, okay, you know, okay. and this is the mid seventies, late seventies, you know, in a, in a, a, a neighborhood that was mixed, right? You know, like I was the only little white kid. My friends were from Central America and they were mm, from the Middle mm. East and they were from Africa and they were African-American and none of us had any money. Most of us had single parents, you know, mm. and we had a great time because we all got to be kids together in the 70s and early 80s. You know, we all watched the same Saturday morning cartoons, you know, and mm -hmm. I'd sleep over my friend's house and his mom would be like frying up plantains, you know, and oil in the kitchen and stuff. So we had a multicultural thing that was sort of bonded by a normal American childhood that was one in which you knew you were sort of below, you know, when Reaganomics hit, for example, all my friends got free lunch and free breakfast and uh -huh. he came in and cut that immediately, you know, so I was aware of how like politics could declare war on its own people that it viewed as like less than worthy from a mm -hmm. political standpoint. And you can add racism into that. But of course, I'm white. So I also was aware that my path out of that situation was going to be easier, uh -huh. you know, than the kids I grew up with. But to answer your question, I, I was the, always the funny guy. I'm a little guy, you know, I'm a little guy now. <laughs> you know, I was a little <laughs> kid and I had to switch schools and move around a lot. Mm. Um, you know, I was in like eight or nine schools before, after, by the time I was in high school. Yeah. So I was the funny guy because it was a rough neighborhood and there was a lot of, you know, things that come with poverty, right? There's a lot of violence and things like that. And we didn't have supervision. This is the seventies latchkey kid era kind of uh -huh. thing. So my sense of humor is what kept me alive. And it happened to dovetail was sort of like the peak of, of, of Richard Pryor, George Carlin, mm -hmm. and then at a later point, Eddie Murphy coming in and really giving voice to what life was like for, for kids oh. in the hood, so to speak, yeah, you know, yeah, that yeah. whole thing he does about like, you ain't got no ice cream. Your dad's <laughs> an alcoholic. Like that was funny as hell to a little <laughs> kid who that was true. <laughs> you know oh, what shoot. I mean? And it also <laughs> reflected the sort of like, the only way to get through the brutality of poverty is to learn how to laugh about it. Do you know what I mean? So all of my comedy comes from a deeper meaning within myself and my own life. It's not just telling, you know, knock, knock jokes or what's yeah, the deal yeah. with airplane food? You know, it was always <laughs> based in reality and it was always based in progressive politics. My early heroes were, were more musicians. You know, yeah. I didn't really aspire to be a comedy comedian. I wanted to be a rock star. And that that <laughs> held true until a few years ago, you know? <laughs> <laughs> what what finally put an end to that well you know i, I still write songs and i'd always okay. written songs and you know my, my uh my mom would move around a lot as i said and would have different people in and out of her life but they always left behind a great record collection 
Oh, you know, so oh. it started with the Rolling Stones and then Jackson Brown and Crosby, Stills and Nash and, you know, all these guys I ended up working for later on. Yeah, in, yeah. As a kid, I just heard the music and there was a lot of poetry in the music, which is what mm -hmm. got me into writing. You know, I wanted to be a songwriter. I shouldn't just say yeah, I yeah. wanted to be a rock star. It's like everybody wants to be a rock star, but I wanted to be able to create the kind of words that would give hope and, and meaning to people because that's what they did for me. And this, I'm an only child, you know, most of my time when it wasn't with my friends was kind of spent alone as a kid. And I would listen to these records and they would take me to another place. Mm -hmm. And in the seventies, the best of the music would also point to a better way to live, you know, because right, we're coming right, out right. of that Vietnam era We'd come out of the sort of tumult of the 60s. And, you know, obviously the utopian dream had faded by then and the harsh realities were upon us. Marvin Gaye was another big influence. You know, yeah, the yeah. people that were documenting the struggle and pointing to a way out, that's who I was drawn to still to this day. Yeah. So who who were those who were those those songwriters who really thrilled you? I mean, like I mean, we're talking back to like Bob Dylan, like in like some of those folk singers that you were talking about. Exactly. Well. Yeah. yeah. Dylan, yeah. you know, when I was in high school, it was Dylan big time, even mm. Pete Seeger. You know, I got okay. involved with Pete Seeger at the Clearwater Festival. I've been going to that since I was a kid and I've oh, worked wow. it as an adult. I, I knew Pete Seeger pretty well. And, uh, you know, I worked with him many times. I did. Ob the last gig I ever did with him was President Obama's inauguration with him oh, and Bruce bad, Springsteen. Yeah, way to go out yeah exactly. But uh, I was at his oh. 90th birthday party at the Garden. Uh, so I Jackson Brown was the top of that list. And uh -huh. then Crosby, Stills and Nash. And, uh, you know, I wanted to follow that path. And I didn't it was, you know, my friends would always be like, you're going to be on SNL someday. You're going to be on a, com you're going to be a comedian, you know? Yeah. And, and as I said, I wanted to be a songwriter. And then by the time I was in my early twenties, I was living in DC working as a bike messenger and working on Capitol Hill mm. as like the in-house bike courier for oh, the okay. congressional okay. budget office. Whoa. And what happened was I was still into that sensitive singer songwriter stuff, you know, Neil Young kind of thing. Yeah. And uh, my neighbor, this guy who lived right next to me, his name was Skeeter. And he played in a band called Scream. And the drummer in that band's name was Dave Grohl. And Dave went out to him. Seattle, yeah. right, and, and got Nirvana and came back. And the whole grunge thing blew up. And, oh, and I literally remember thinking like, well, nobody wants to hear this singer songwriter stuff right now. And like. I don't want to rock out that hard. Yeah. And I, I took an acting class just as another way to kind of, you know, expand myself. Cause I, I'd been in plays as a little kid and I knew I had aptitude in that area and it was a light went off, you know, and within a year I was at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts in New York city Whoa. where my grandmother had also gone to school with Grace Kelly, you know, mm. 40 years earlier. And, uh, you know, I was there and, and, and I immediately showed some skills as a comedic actor, you know, and the mm -hmm. teachers would take me aside and they say, look, you have timing that we can't really teach anybody like you should, you know, you should really do comedy, you know, comedic acting and stuff. And of course, like I still wanted to be James Dean, you know, I was like, no, I just want to get mad and like throw stuff on stage like. <laughs> You know, because I was a young drama student, yeah. you know, you want to be angsty and like Marlon right. Brando and stuff. And uh, and then, you know, the comedy has a way of, uh, you know, taking over and I'll get into that. You know, we can get into that or you can ask another question. Yeah, yeah. But essentially what happened is and for your listeners at the same time, this had all happened. I'd snuck into Jackson Brown's dressing room when I was about 17. He was playing at Radio City. At this point, I was living with my grandparents in New York because my mom had her life had taken a, a, a tough turn. She, she's still with us and she's she's sober to this day. But, you know, she ended up getting incarcerated for her drug and alcohol use. So I moved in with my grandparents and I'd written a paper on American imperialism in Central America that was yeah, inspired, wow, wow. So right? Light, Lighthearted stuff, huh? Right, yeah, for, for my fellow classmates because they didn't really understand what like Iran-Contra was and everything, uh -huh. you know? And I'd written this paper and, you know, I remember the English teacher was like, I, I got the only A in the class. I think everybody else got a D or something, huh, you know? Huh. And, and otherwise I was a terrible student because I didn't care to be there. You know, I was smart, but I was just kind of like, I'd been through so much at that point that like, I was just like, give me my diploma. <laughs> Let me get out, yeah, out of yeah. here. And uh, I snuck into Jackson's dressing room and explained all this to him. 
And he shook my hand and sort of talked to me about politics and, you know, in a roundabout way, kind of took me under his wing. You know, I started getting backstage passes. I'd run into him again when I moved back down to DC, as I mentioned, working on Capitol Hill. And uh, at the same time, I met somebody who worked in live TV, you know, and they said, hey, you're into all that kind of stuff. You're into acting, music. Why don't you come work for me as a PA in live television? And that was the Kennedy Center Honors in 1993, Whoa. right? Whoa. So I'm just like, all of a sudden, like, in a room with Aretha Franklin and Billy Preston and, you know, Johnny Carson. And, and I, I understood that like, that was my ticket to an apprenticeship, you know, and it, no pun intended. Right. No. Oh, I forgot. You're yeah, better yeah, than yeah. me. Hey, you know, yeah. the books, you want to talk about books, Narcissus and Goldman was a big influence on me around uh, that era, you know, and there's that whole story where he's kind of like traveling, you know, through Europe and doing these apprenticeships. And I remember thinking like, this is my chance to sort of run away and join the circus. Yeah. And it was, you know, and I just, I, I stayed doing it until night until 2017, basically, Whoa. you know, 2016. Yeah. Well, let me pick up on a couple of things there. Um, one, you're talking about the Clearwater with, with Pete Seeger, right? Did you, did you stop by Scientology at all? Did you stop by the national headquarters there? And No, no, oh, you're talking about Florida. No, Clearwater, oh. it, it was the name of a festival meant like clean water. It was, he saved the <laughs> Hudson Valley. Okay. But I, I, I feel you on that. I don't, I don't have I any, thinking. I don't know where Miscavige's wife is. If that's Okay, what that's, that's what I was getting at. Thank you. Right. I was like, okay, clear, literally clear water. Wow, all right. right. Um, so when you're talking about like being like the, the kid who was funny as, you know, makes a lot of sense. You were going to a lot of different schools and all of that. Um, did you even at that time get the idea of like making fun of or laughing with versus laughing at, you know, this whole idea of like, you know, punching down yeah. you know, where you'd be like, hi, oh, look at that kid. He's, he's, he's a loser. Or was it more like, let's all laugh together. It was definitely let's all laugh together. Cause I was coming from a place of vulnerability, you mm -hmm. know? So I would, I would, I would be the class clown and put the joke on myself, but there were times where I made fun of another kid before they got a chance to make fun of me. Yeah. And I regret that stuff to this day, you know, and that's mm -hmm. part of growing up and learning, you know, and if, if I have any regrets in life, it's those times when I could have been kind mm -hmm. and I wasn't mm -hmm. out of my own fear and insecurity. You know, if I had anything to go back and do, I would do that in a heartbeat. I'd put my arm around those kids that get picked on and I'd use my skills in service of defending those people, which I did many times, you know, sure, but you sure. don't remember the times you did the right thing, right? You remember the times that you had the chance to do the right thing and you didn't, but that makes you a richer person if you can get perspective on it and improve, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. With that, with that same perspective, like, you know, like a Richard Pryor, who's somebody, you know, who, who showed a lot of vulnerability, right? I mean, he was also like, he was known as, you know, quick, 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 and, you know, I mean, hilarious and all that, but, but deep. Do you look back at like, you know, it's like watching like the Simpsons when you're like an eight-year-old and Bart makes fart jokes and you laugh and, you know, 15 years later, you're getting the Jimmy Carter references. You know what I mean? Yeah. Do you like, do you watch like the old like comedy differently? Or did you feel like you kind of got it even at a young age? Like you understood the, like the essence of it, I guess. I think I understood the essence of it. I mean, especially with Richard Pryor, because he and I actually had pretty somewhat similar childhoods. I'm not African-American. You know, I didn't grow up in a, in a brothel like he did, but I had the same sort of circumstances in my life. Trust me. You know, I had some weird stuff going on around me that I won't get into now that would put me on that level. You know, my mom went to prison when I was 13 for robbing eight banks, if that gives you any idea. Eight. You know, eight. So and seven, uh, seven successful and eighth was not. Oh my yeah. God. The last one she had, she handed a note to the teller and she'd gone to high school with the girl and she dropped a dime oh, on her. And no, my mom no. was in, you know, free, free basin. I mean, not free basin, speedball and heroin okay. and cocaine. And the FBI came and dragged her out. And, you know, that was it. It was the last time I saw my mom for five years, you know, came and took her and I'm stuck in this, you know, apartment with no working phone and, and furniture and stuff. So, you know, similar circumstances, mm -hmm. right? You know, kind of real definite childhood trauma, you know, and uh, I read Richard Pryor's biography, you know, there was the Jojo Dancer movie that came out in the 80s. And I remember mm -hmm. reading the bio, and this has always stuck with me. He's sitting in the car with his father waiting for his mom's funeral. Mm -hmm. And the father mm -hmm. says to him, it's really cold, you know, they're in he's not from Cleveland, but somewhere there in Ohio. And uh, his father says to him, if it gets any colder, they're going to have to bury the bitch by herself. 
Mm. You know, and I remember that sort of like the the brutality of that moment. You know what oh, I mean? Yeah, and yeah, you could. Yeah, yeah. So whenever I watched Richard Pryor, as I'm sure most people can, they, they see the pain in him, you know, and and yeah, and I would yeah. listen to Richard Pryor tapes with my mom in later years. You know, mm -hmm. we would buy them and listen to him in the car and stuff. So he was probably the one that, uh, you know, I related to the most just because it was so raw. And then mm -hmm. George Carlin, my grandparents took me to see when I was in high school. He's the one where you look back on it and you're like, man he's nailing stuff. You know, right, I get a right. lot of credit. I'm not a famous comedian, but you know, people follow me on Twitter and they like what I have to say politically. And I'll go back and watch these old clips. And I'm like, he was saying that 25 years ago, you know, he got it, especially about the sort of like, you know, the class structure and the American oligarchs, if you will, that are pointing mm -hmm. strings. You know, if you read Howard Zinn, you know, the great liberal professor, he talks about that, you know, the oldest con in this country was making the like sort of indentured service servants and, and poor whites resent, you know, right? yes, the yes. recently enslaved people. So they didn't realize it was really the landowners that were screwing them over. Right. But mm -hmm. you get poor people to resent other poor people, you know, or, or people that are disenfranchised to resent other people that are vulnerable and you don't look at who's really doing it. You know, and, and and MAGA came along and I saw that as an absolute sort of doing that again, updating that. You know what I mean? Like the Mexicans are taking your jobs. Like nothing could be further from the truth. But all these sort of like red state Americans were thinking this dude who was a millionaire by the time he was 11 months old, you know, who sits on a golden toilet on Fifth Avenue, you know, was going to save the working man in Alabama because he was able to blame somebody else, you know, and, and ignorance, you know, is, is contagious in that way, especially if you do it and it falls into this group think kind of thing, right? If, if you, if you wrap it up in an American flag and jingoistic kind of rhetoric, it's, it's a potent drug uh, for malnourished minds, right? So that's, I, I, that's, I, that's a deep line right thank there. Thank you, brother. I just made that up right now. Oh that's the God, kind of writing I like is in freestyle. the moment. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, oh so I recognized the danger immediately and I knew my role in that if I had any, like I knew my, my skills were going to come back into service in terms of explaining it. And this is an interesting point I wouldn't mind making. I realized in 16 or 17, because I'd written protest songs and, and things like that, you know, I had a song that the Southern Poverty Law Center put out to raise oh, wow. money oh, wow. about the riots in, in Missouri that was actually recorded by, get this, uh, Woody Guthrie's granddaughter, Sarah Lee Guthrie, and oh, her husband, my. who is John Steinbeck's great nephew. Whoa. So, Whoa. right, Whoa. the two main yeah. Dust Bowl guys' progeny yeah. were, were, were singing my song, which was oh, a thrill. It's wonderful. But I realized in 17 that like songs weren't going to do it, like that the mm. news cycle was going so fast that the comedians were the ones that were going to have to address this, right? Because by the time you wrote a song about something that was going to happen, by the time you wrote, recorded, and put that song, there's 10 yeah, other scandals. Yeah. You oh, needed yeah, to be able to punch back on this in real time. And Twitter became the perfect vehicle to do that because it was kind of playing out on Twitter, right? That's when Trump was on there, you know? Like you said, there, there was, I mean, it was not long ago. There was there was 13 scandals a day. Right. You wake up, you know, the, the, the doom scrolling and the, it's just, yeah, like you said, yeah, and that makes a lot of sense. The songs are not, they're not in real time as much as this boom, 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 boom. And man, thank goodness he's off Twitter. Jesus. I know. That's you, a blessing. You, you were quoted in one of the other interviews. You said, you said that you grew up in the 80s in New York. You know, you talked about a lot of right. that time. And Trump was a joke, right? He was an absolute joke. I mean, New Yorkers know, right? They know oh. that he's just a complete clown. A hundred percent. You know, I moved up to New York in night, very beginning, I think, of 1985, like New Year's Day of 1985. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, Trump Tower had opened in 83. He was trying to get his name everywhere. Those were the days where he would call up page six as John Barron and like plant a story about like this studly guy. You know, fiction. Right, who was at <laughs> Studio 54 last night pulling all the ladies. And, and <laughs> you know, he was a joke. And the whole Marla Maples thing where he was trying uh -huh. to embarrass his first wife. Like, you know, he was a tool and he represented 
he represented, you know, in many ways, he was the embodiment of a lot of what happened in the 80s, though, right? Because you had Reagan, you had him deregulating everything, you had this sort of greed is good, Gordon Gecko, sure. Wall Street attitude. And that's where I saw a lot of cultural things sort of bounce up against my upbringing, right? Because I was coming mm -hmm. at it from the place I just described to you. I'm coming from outside of DC mm -hmm. with amongst people that didn't have a lot, you know? Yeah. And then I'm up here in Northern Westchester with these kids that grew up in houses with yards and all kinds of stuff, but they were spewing this anti-union rhetoric, mm -hmm. anti-minority rhetoric mm -hmm. that that was part of the sort of calcification of the Reagan years where he's mm -hmm. cutting humanities, right? He's cutting mm -hmm. arts education and, and sort of the American suburban white male is is given this message that like greed is good and consumerism yeah. is good and all these protections were just like the liberals idea of trying to hold back you know rugged american individualism and in reality what was happening all these companies were moving offshore it was corporate raiders it was the era yeah, of yeah. carl icon and all these guys just screwing over generations of people in the rust belt right mm -hmm. so like you know, you could no longer go to a factory and make 35, 40 bucks an hour and put two kids through college and have a house and a couple of cars, right? That was all getting removed. But at the same time, that stuff was getting dismantled. The people that were dismantling it were telling the people that were going to be worse off from this situation that like, it was morning in America, you know, and Reagan right. was like establishing this, this, this like, you know, shiny, you know, beacon on a hill, whatever the, the flowery language was, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, it was bullshit, right? If you'd been paying attention, you'd seen that story before and it was complete bullshit, you know, and, and again, Trump was just a, a redux of, of that, but it's, you know, we keep tripping over the same thing as Americans. And a lot of that is the inability to face the inequality, you know, to, to face racial injustice. Like you look at what the big fight is now in all these red states, it's CRT. Like it doesn't even exist. They're not even teaching it, right? But it's such a visceral thing to charge up their base. And they're mm -hmm. doing it up here. It's not just in the South. It's not just Tennessee. Oh, yeah, like yeah, yeah, they yeah. called somebody the N-word at a school board, board meeting where I went to high school you know, which is Northern Westchester, which is the same town that AOC went to high school in, mm -hmm. by the way, though I'm much older than her. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, even like, even late eighties, right. New York had what the, like talking New York city had what the crown Heights riots. Yeah. You know, I know like Bensonhurst, there were, instead of saying racial riots, racist riots. Right. And yeah. Howard beach, Howard beach yeah. happened. Then there was, right. you know, Bernie Getz happened. That was a yeah. big moment in New York. It was like, that's how it was. Cause you know, the media also played into it, you know, cause it was the, the wolf packs and the, mm -hmm. you know, kids on crack were well, going to kill Park. you. Central right. Park. The central Park five, which was Donald Trump, right. Yeah. Donald Trump took out a full page ad in the New York times, as you know, and said, hang these kids, you know, just like straight vigilanteism. Right. He I mean, so, you know, we talk about him as, a, as an absolute clown. Like you said, you frame him in the 80s where he was perfect for the Gordon Gecko era and all of that. You know, the, the trickle down that didn't trickle down, you know, Reagan right. and all that. Did he, did Mark Burnett make him president in some way? Yes, yes, 100%. You know, a combination of Mark Burnett and Vladimir Putin, <laughs> quite honestly, because people <laughs> don't know about. this, but. Well, Mark Burnett's original idea is he went to Putin and he wanted to do a show on the Mir space station and the mm -hmm. oligarchs that were helping fund that. So that's where he went with that original idea. And they told him, no, you want to do a show on our guy in New York, Donald mm -hmm. Trump. And mm -hmm. that's how The Apprentice, the original Apprentice that started in like 2003. I did Celebrity Apprentice. Right. You know, It had already right. been on for like eight years when I did it. Yeah, but yeah. and it. I dealt with celebrity talent, so I had no role in the normal reality show. But my point is, you know, it was Putin who said, go look, you know, go look at, at Trump in New York. And it was Mark Burnett and NBC, right? Jeff Zucker, who, who just mm -hmm. left CNN, was the head of, you know, NBC Universal Entertainment mm -hmm. at the time. And they whitewashed Donald Trump's image at that point because he was broke. He, he was done before that you know the 80s had fizzled out he fizzled out in the 90s people mm -hmm. got sick of his shtick his casinos had all gone bankrupt yeah. he wasn't a force at all and then they were able to sort of revitalize that 
carny kind of like i'm the great deal maker thing yeah, and it was yeah, compelling yeah, television because yeah. it happened to come about at the time that reality shows became like the thing that everybody was watching you know and they had a four i watched that show i watched uh -huh. celebrity apprentice that's the reason i took the gig because my uh, friend got the job like to talent coordinating the finale mm -hmm. and she was like i need some help you know we're doing a finale i need some kind of experienced guys because to be honest it was way beneath me like i did the super bowl halftime show the grammys the tonys this is like d-list tv yeah 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 but I'd watch the show. So I was like, oh, hell yeah, I'll do that. I want to see if Amorosa is a real person. <laughs> like, I just did it as a lark. And I went down there and they're like, all right, you're in charge of the Trump family, Ivanka and stuff. You know, it was first it was the celebrities. And then when Ivanka joined the show, she was my 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 talent. But oh my gosh. Yeah. So I did it kind of just on a lark and no one thought he was going to become president. You know, that's the other thing is that he was a joke then, too. Yeah. Like yeah, everyone yeah. knew it was fake. The dude can't read. Like uh -huh. he literally cannot read. You need like 10 takes to put together one clip of him not messing up a word. So. Well, no, I, no, no, I just, no. As, as always, I just continue to just shake my head. Right. I mean, how is this possible? How is this real life? You know, how is a guy I, I think of when after the, the horrific El Paso shooting and he goes back in and they do a photo op with a baby who lost his parents. Right. I right? remember that. Yeah. I mean, how, how did this is the guy who's, you know, the president? I mean, he is a great Christian, but uh, <laughs> right. I mean, right? great Christian, two Corinthians or whatever the heck he said did. So I guess fast forwarding then to, to 2016 around that time, like the quandary, if it even a quandary, you know, way better than I do because you've been in the business. Like did did and do I'm talking present tense. Did the media give him too much air? Like, how do you deal with this yeah. guy? How do you deal with a guy who's so loud and obnoxious and annoying and, you know, gets ratings, but also is the devil incarnate? Right. Well, they they 100 percent gave him too much attention. And like it was no secret what he was and things he had done. You know, I worked on the beauty pageants, too, in the 90s. And it was, yeah. you know, that stuff is not a joke. He would line up the contestants and inspect them and, you know, do all kinds of really disgusting things that he wouldn't have gotten away with if his name wasn't on the pageant, you know, and, and people didn't right? want to, right. He owned the good thing, you know, and, and, and you got to understand these TV crew people, you know, it's hard to get these gigs. Everybody's a freelancer. If you're in the mm. DGA and you're directing that show, you're making half of your money for the year off of that one event, right? Okay. You got two kids in college. You're not going to really spill the beans. You're going to kind of mm. keep your mouth shut and let him feel up the contestants for an hour on stage and just make sure you keep your crew off to the side so you don't lose any money out of the budget, right? So I already knew that the industry was willing to acquiesce to his mm -hmm. Uh, inappropriate behavior and, and mind you he wasn't alone in that at this point okay every you know okay. this is the era of harvey weinstein and matt lauer and you know asshole white guys abusing their power and abusing women was pretty much standard operating procedure unfortunately in the business especially when i got into it okay but Yes. To answer your question, in 2015, what happened was he's doing these debates, right? It's the summer of 2015. He's doing a debate in July or whatever. He makes fun of Megyn Kelly. He makes fun of little Marco Rubio. And all of a sudden the ratings are off the hook because it's yeah. a reality show that's on CNN, right? So Jeff Zucker and these guys realize it's a cash cow. And all the air goes out of all the other candidates, right? You know, big, you couldn't get... These guys overnight. couldn't get arrested overnight, no, right? No. Jeb Bush mm -hmm. couldn't get arrested after yeah. that first thing, right? He's low energy, man. He's low energy. Right. So, <laughs> you know, exactly. You know, so the media kind of was playing chicken with him and thinking, well, in the end, cooler heads will prevail. So yeah. let's just ride this wave until Hillary wins in 16, you know, and we'll all have made money and he'll go back out into obscurity. And that's not, you know, that's obviously not what happened. And towards the end, you know, in that fall, Mm -hmm. I continued to speak out on social media and somebody who worked for Hillary's campaign that I worked with on, on President Obama's inaugurations reach out, reached out to me and said, you know, would you like to tell Hillary's campaign and go on the record with this stuff? And I said, gladly, you yeah. know, yeah, gladly, because yeah, yeah. this guy, if he wins, is going to be the worst thing that ever happened to this country. 
So I spoke out. I tried to get my colleagues to speak out because, you know, the New York Times was calling everybody. You know, people were trying to do something about it, mm -hmm. but um, nobody wanted to talk. All my colleagues were like, hey, look, he's not going to win anyway. Yeah, right. Yeah. Why should I lose my job? Because the thing is, in, in live TV and talent, you're not supposed to talk about anything that goes down. It's just kind of unseemly, even so if it's. The, I would say even without the NDA. Even without the NDA, you know, I worked with Michael Jackson, Madonna. I did the uh -huh. VMAs for 20 years. You're just J-Lo. Like uh -huh. if you're a tattle who goes and talks about things you see, you're not going to work in that business because it's too much baggage. You sure. know, producers have a lot on the line. You don't want talent coming in there thinking that the PA's spying on them or calling mm -hmm. up page six. It's just, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's something that isn't done. And I had to make a decision like, okay, I understand that my colleagues can't do this and they're not in a position necessarily to speak out, but I am because mm -hmm. I was burnt out on the business at that point. You know, I'm probably what, like 2000, I'm 45 years old at this point. You know, I'd been touring with rock bands. I toured with Crosby, Stills and Nash and Jackson and all these guys. I worked with Springsteen and Stones. So I'd kind of already gotten everything I needed. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd already done 12 Super Bowl halftime shows or yeah, something yeah. at that point. So I was like, well, I'm going to step aside and speak out because if this guy gets elected, we're, we're done, you know, and then he got elected and then it was on me again. Like, okay, now I got to, now I got to figure out another way to even be more effective. Yeah, and yeah. that's, that's where comedy and writing sort of took over, you know, because I went to see Judd Apatow. He was uh, given a speech at the 92nd Street Y, which is a, a, you know, an organization in New York that'll have writers in and things like that. His okay, first okay. book had just come out, Sick in the Head. The second one just came out now. And it was a collection of comedians. And I realized again how, how much in common I had with a lot of these comedians in mm -hmm. terms of life skills, so to speak, you know, the kind of the broken parts that make you a good comedian. I was like, oh, I got that shit. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, Jack that's right. Exactly. <laughs> so I was like, let me just try and, and yeah. not even doing it for attention or trying to have a career as a comedian or any of that stuff. It was just a purely artistic expression of me trying to yeah. get up and speak the truth. As I said, like a Woody Guthrie or something like, mm -hmm. Hey folks. And that's, you know, it was all true about him snorting Adderall and all this kind of stuff. And I just started performing it from my own artistic, you know, sanity, right. Yeah, to get yeah, it out yeah. and tell somebody, and it would be, you know, a nightclub with 50 people on a Friday night. And then people would come up after and they're like, is that true? Did that really happen? And I'm like, yep, you know, and I talked to all these people, you could feel people were hungry to sort of come together and talk about how mm. crazy stuff was getting right. Yeah. And then, you know, one night somebody recorded my, my set and uh, I, they gave me a copy of it and I gave it to my buddy. Who's got a group called the trailer park boys, which is mm. a big Canadian, like improv troupe. Yeah, they have yeah. a TV show. They're very popular. They're good friends of mine. So uh, <laughs> I sent it to my buddy bubbles, you know, Mike Smith, who's bubbles. And uh, he was like, hey, man, do you mind if I tweet this out? And I was like, no, man, but let me set up another Twitter because I shut down my Twitter after <laughs> Trump first got elected. I was so disgusted, you right? know, <laughs> I like shut down my original account. So I started another account. He tweeted it out. I went to sleep. He had tagged me. I woke up in the morning and I think it was on its way to like four million views. What? Kathy Griffin had retweeted it. Judd Apatow, uh... Paul McCartney's people like it was just insane. And at that point, like reporters were sneaking into my building. We were in the, you know, in our place in the city at that point. Uh -huh. Reporters are sneaking into my building. We had to run up to the country and hide out for a couple of days and stuff <laughs> just because it was, you know, it was new to me having kind of the heat on you. And, and that was the revelations about him snorting Adderall, which is yeah. all true, you know, all 100% wow. true. You know, so you, had, you had to go on the lamb. Yeah, basically, you know, for a couple of days, you know. Shoot. Well, so when he, like, he's, you know, you said like, a lot of your colleagues are like, he's not going to win anyway. Right. And, you know, I think so many of us felt like that until the very last moment that he, when, you know, they said, hey, he did win. There's an incredible Law and Order episode. The, the actor, he was on House for a while. He plays this like, ah, shucks kind of lawyer, right? It's an absolute open and shut case. The guy clearly killed his, his business associate. Like, there's nothing, you know, nothing to see here. 
he works out the the jury and he's laughing with them oh you know grandma and this and that you know totally innocuous seeming right the the trial starts he makes it into a referendum on the israeli palestinian conflict and almost wins the case you know and you know sam waterston J- uh, jack mccoy gets more and more pissed off like how is this happening what is going on this can't be happening this was an open and shut case you know the good, the good guys finally win. He, he is, a, a, um, you know, indicted. My whole point to that is I told my wife, I'm like, watch this episode. That's Trump. Right. Because at the very end, that lawyer goes, he sees Jack and he buys him a drink. He's like, yeah, I gave it a try. Right. I gave it a try. Right. I totally thought that was going to be Trump. Right. right? Wasn't, wasn't he trying to like promote like his suppose like a new, you know, cable news station or whatever. Exactly. Like, right. Yeah. His media thing. He he didn't want to be president. If you yeah. if you remember, because I remember the night he won, and I had a friend who was in the room. He looked terrified. He yes, looked shocked he when he yes, came he out did. of there. Because to me, it was the equivalent of like, you got three kilos of cocaine in your suitcase, and mm. you just had somebody drop you off at the airport, and now you have to walk through the baggage. <laughs> yeah. place, you know, Seriously. like that. Like you just bought a ticket, and now you yeah. got to go go to the gate. You know, and mm. you know what what you have to hide. So, and I could see that all over his face because the dude yeah. is dirty as the day is long, yeah. you know, but obviously he adjusted, right. You know, cause that's the other thing is that so many syncophants came out of the woodwork and not oh, just they did. Synca, they right. did. <laughs> all the venal men that were like, no, we got this. We'll teach you how to do this thing. You know, oh, your Mike okay. Flynn's and your Roger Stone's uh-huh. and you know, it goes on and on. So it became this orgy of grifters, you know, well, that, <laughs> that sort of reigned in his insan- insanity and did a lot of the heavy lifting behind the scenes. You know, in my experience with that family, Jared Kushner and Ivanka were running everything. You know, by the final years I worked on Apprentice, mm-hmm. they were running the show. Trump is like, I tell people this, Trump wants music to play when he walks in the room. He <laughs> wants to get high and he wants to hit on girls. Like all of his things are just mm-hmm. about feel- filling that hole inside of him yes. in the moment. Yes. Right. That's yeah. why he's showing up at weddings at Mar-a-Lago and just like walking <laughs> into the rooms like, hey, you want me to do a 20 minute set? You know, like <laughs> like because he just needs immediate gratification. There's no long game in Trump. He's yes. a con. You know what yes. I mean? Yeah. Like, but yeah. it's his his needs are much more visceral. He's lost uh-huh. more money than most people will make where those other guys are, you know, stealthy and a uh-huh. little more disciplined. And that's why they walked out of the White House with $640 million, right? Jared and Ivanka made $640 million, right? $640 million. So, so, I mean, is he, is he in any way a manipulator or is he totally manipulated? It's a combination of both, okay? He's the, he's the easiest person in the world to manipulate, yeah. right? And that's why his first trip overseas was the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Oh, God, touching the little ball. The orb, there. yeah, the, the orb, orb and the sword dance. Yeah. That was Jared and those guys. They prepped him how to deal with their dad. You know, they had his picture hanging on the side of a building, you oh, know, 20 stories it. high. Right, so he's easy to kiss up to and manipulate, mm-hmm. but he's also... He is a bit of a showman con man, you know, Mm -hmm. and this may sound weird to your viewers like, but before he was president, like you almost didn't hate him as much, like, cause he was like a cartoon character. Like he was so pathetic and needy Mm -hmm. that he had been this kind of New York joke character Mm -hmm. that wasn't, you know, behind the scenes, he was obviously evil and a sexual predator and all this stuff. But, you know, in public, he this this will offend a sentient being but there is a level to charm of charm to him mm. in a way and 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 that's i'm using i'm giving you know yeah, charm. It's, all super, it's all superficial right I mean, it's completely right superficial. but it is like you know there is some some element of charisma to mm-hmm. him you know mm-hmm. you can see why the people that like him like him right because he's he's coming to them and he's he's kind of the pt barman barn barnum now you know, in these MAGA rallies in red states, like he, he does have that skill, you know, he, he, he does the, th- he wants to be liked, you know, the, the pathetic thing about that guy is he wants to be liked, you know, as opposed to like a Ron DeSantis or somebody who's copying his shtick, but clearly yeah, yeah. doesn't care what anybody thinks of him no, and no, no, doesn't no. need your adulation. Trump needs adulation mm-hmm. all day long, you know, all day long. Yeah. Your, your quote was that he'd, he'd blow up the world rather than get embarrassed. Right. Is it, is it also like he'd 
he'd he'd blow up the world rather than i don't know i guess i'm also getting at like he doesn't want to do any work right so i wonder where that balance was between him doing like he talked about he could have done so much damage he get you know like you say he lives in the moment someone pisses him off he hits you know he, he bombs somebody but then also he's lazy as hell and he doesn't want to do anything yeah right right i mean i mean how much of that did you see of him of just like not like caring about anything other than himself in the moment oh that was you know he would miss most of the a lot of the call times and stuff you know he'd cancel when they were filming the show he would just be like yeah i'm not gonna make it in for the five (laughs) o'clock call like as i said they would have to piece together things you know i did the final finale so he'd have to show up because it was live on nbc you know but my buddies that did the week in way week Mm -hmm. out you know taping the little john's pop-up shop in times square (laughs) with meatloaf or whatever and you're standing there in the rain waiting for donald trump to do a hit at three o'clock and they'd get a call at 2 30 like yeah he's not feeling it today he's not going to show up you know none of them work like nobody in that family ever worked and and the other thing is their company was like 12 employees you know they always tried to like hey a family organization (laughs) right the trump organization trump is 12 guys like with here here's an example when mark Mm -hmm. burnett because my buddy was one of the main audio guys on the Mm -hmm. the the original apprentice and when they went into trump tower to film the pilot, they looked around and all like the couches and furniture that he had was so ratty and threadbare that they were like, no one's going to believe you're a billionaire. So they had to rent like set furniture and like the boardroom, all that stuff you saw, that was all fake. That was all, <laughs> we shot the first Celebrity Apprentice on the, in the Studio 8H at SNL mm-hmm. on the same stage where you watch him come out every week and say live from New York. That's where the first boardroom apprentice was of the first well, I mean, season. Everything was fake, right? Everything was fake. Right. Yeah. Just a complete. Oh, my gosh. Well, so speaking of the family, like you, uh, <laughs> I thought it was interesting. You talked about what Ivanka talks, what, I guess, a, an octave lower in real life than she does. Yeah. Yeah. Right. The whole daddy thing. There's that great. Did you see that great Saturday Night Live skit where it's it's the perfume complicit? Yes, exactly. Right? Yeah. How, how complicit are they? You know, I mean, I always think of of Eric getting slapped around literally by his dad, right? Like comes to yeah. his dorm room, whatever. How much do they, do they like their dad? Do they love no. their dad? Like at all? Like, is there any sort of affection? Are they, are they normal people who at least have no, none? Not at all. They're, they're, they're all psychopaths. They're a family of psychopaths. And I'm not saying that to be cruel. It's just, they're, they're broken people. Imagine, uh-huh. you know, Trump was a broken guy when he was a kid. That's yeah. why his family shipped him off to middle, middle, middle uh, military school. Mm-hmm. He was punching his teachers. He tried to throw his roommate out of a window. He couldn't read. He's basically dyslexic and they never treated it. That's why they hide all his medical records. That's why he'll say like smocking gun, you know, yeah, in mini yeah, yeah. Annapolis for many, because they write everything out phonetically. He just never really learned to read. You know, he can read, but it's a struggle. So the family is like Don Jr. hated him right for mm-hmm. a long time and mm-hmm. drank at him and used yeah. drugs at him right sure, and sure, then realized sure. he couldn't outrun his father so he sort of became his father yeah. and now he's in this public relapse because when i work with those kids they didn't they all have drug and alcohol problems and there's no shame in that i'm in recovery myself mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. but they, they were in various stages of being dry you know abstaining from the abuse because the dad's a drug addict he just, you know, and he drinks too. It's the other thing they always say, Donald Trump doesn't ah. drink. He's just scared of alcohol. It's not his drug of choice. So okay. he would take benzos and he would take stimulants, cocaine, Adderall and stuff. But he would get bottle service in the clubs in mm-hmm. the 90s. I know people have served him. So mm-hmm. it's all BS that he doesn't yeah. drink. But alcoholism, you know, runs in the family. His older brother was an alcoholic. His yep. kids, you know, have obvious issues you know mm-hmm. getting carried out of things don jr got his ass kicked in the comedy cellar in 2003 because oh, he was yeah. laughing too loud at a, a ra- racial kind of joke on stage mm. and the people next to him kind of took umbrage and told him to shut up and he spilt his beer on like the guy's girlfriend oh, and then no. yeah two guys from a guy from staten island and a guy from the bronx like took him outside and, and <laughs> beat his ass and it, nobody deserves violence but you know it when you're publicly getting your ass kicked in, you know, mm. in the comedy cellar for being too drunk, you have a problem. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like That's the first sign, right? Right. Yeah. That's sign a sign you need to, to hit a meeting, you know? So my point is they're all 
they're all living in self-centered fear and mm-hmm. and the knives are out now right because mm-hmm. you know trump may not go to jail but the company is certainly taking a hit and and most likely will be dissolved to some extent you know if letitia yeah. james is allowed to continue with what she's continuing it's a civil case but it'll have a major impact on his company on the and they'll turn on each other you know oh, and, and ivanka was the heir to the throne you know mm-hmm. ivanka was the only one that he liked he, he sort of hated don jr but you know yeah. what you can see that in their body language when they're together he just he doesn't like don jr nobody likes don jr the dalai lama would be like i'm gonna punch that guy in the face i don't know why and the pope would be like i'll hold him bro i'll hold him <laughs> You hit them. There's just and maybe forgiven, right? They'd be forgiven for it. Right. It was just something <laughs> about the way he walks. You know, it's like, uh, do you know who uh Skakel is? Or what was that guy's name? You know, the, the oh yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, totally. The guy you know, about, the, talking the guy about the Wu Tang album and he, right, he made, that guy he made Shrek- insulin one Shrekling. million dollars. Yeah, Martin Shrekel, right? Yeah, he's like that guy. You just don't even know like why, but you initially don't like him. You know, the funniest thing I ever read was when that guy was on trial, they they were doing like the jury polling. Right. They were trying to find jurors and they'd hold up a picture of him and they'd be like, do you know who this is? And people like, "Uh uh-uh. And they're like, do you have any feelings about it? They'd be like, yeah, I don't like him. I don't like him. (laughs) I don't like the way that's junior. Huh? Right. And and I was uh, I was actually. I did the NBA all-star game, as I said, for a long, I don't know if I said that, but that was one of my gigs I did every year for like 12 years. Mm -hmm. And I was up in, uh, in Toronto when it was in Toronto, I think 2015 or something. And I was staying at, you know, I stayed at a nice hotel because I take care of the talent. I got to stay with them. Right. So I was in this nice hotel and I'm coming in one of those lobby circular doors Mm. and I see the guy across from me, you know, like you're in your little section and you're moving like this. I see the guy across me. Is that Martin Screlly guy? Oh, no. Right. But I can't place his face. I just recognize him anywhere. Right. I recognize him. (laughs) And I'm like, who is that? Who is that? And he can see me locking eyes on him, like trying to figure out who he is as I walk in the lobby. And it's like a glass lobby. And he keeps my gaze and he sees the moment that I figure out it's him. And this kind of like look of dejection and disgust goes across my face. And he goes, yep, I am. that." Ah, Like it was so he's living crazy. Right. Oh he was so God. aware of who he was, you know, she's is, you know, the, the thing about Trump and we, you know, we can't minimize it is that he is, I mean, he's done so many evil things. I love how you throw those numbers out there for coronavirus. I mean, for him, obviously criminal is not even close to the word to keep all that news to him, to keep right. Fauci caged. Up, I mean, all the things he's done, I mean, absolutely war criminal times a million, right? But 100%. He's also, he's also, as you know, way better than I do. He's also the, oddest weirdest dude ever he's so weird does he have does he have like friends like a like a guy you call on the phone and have a, a beer with or a, a benzo with no no he doesn't have friends you know he has associates and now he's got a lot yeah. more people kissing his ass because he's got yeah. a whole religion basically behind him the oh, magaism yeah. in the days i was around him like he'd go golfing with other rich people i have a friend who used to golf with him and he would like he was in a text chain with these other guys <laughs> and he would send out texts. You know, you know how guys talk like, oh, look uh, at her tits or whatever. Right. He would always say the most disgusting things and like, you know, like grab them by the pussy is a great example. Sure, like he sure. talked not how normal guys talked. Yes. Like what guy says something like that? Right. It just it shows like how sort of like always sort of the odd man out he was. Yeah. And I have a friend who worked in live TV who was a transportation coordinator, and he saw Trump doing blow on this show we did in 2002 in the limo with a bunch of models and stuff. But this guy was a main kind of like he worked for Steve Rubell at Studio 54 back in the day. And he'd be in that room, you know, like the VIP upstairs lounge, whatever it was. It's before my time. You know, I'm 50. But um He would be there and he said, yeah, Donald would come and he would like be standing there in a suit, you know, and so it'd be like Bianca Jagger and Liza Minnelli and Truman Capote doing lines and stuff. (laughs) And Trump was always kind of just standing around like a dork, like he never knew how to really like mix in with the real party, you know? Well, I mean, that that infamous, um, I guess it's a short video, that infamous video of him and Epstein, right? I mean, that perfectly sums him up where he's kind of like bobbing his head, you know? 
I try to picture him dancing and then I got to go throw up in the garbage can or something, you know? Yeah, exactly. Right. The white man's overbite. And it, <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up. That WMO. Yeah. No. Cause the best thing about that video though, the best thing, the best character tale in that video mm -hmm. is he says something to Epstein, right? Epstein doubles over in embarrassment. So even think Epstein. about that. Yeah. What, right. You just made Epstein be like, bro, I can't even believe yeah. you said that. If you watch the video, Trump's like in his ear, like, boy, if I got her alone, I would. Right. He said the same kind of stuff that he said to my friend in this text yeah. chain yeah. who was yeah. like, bro, take me out of this text chain. My wife is going to see this and think I'm a freak like you because Trump yeah. likes young girls and all that stuff, you know? Yeah. So, but think about what it takes to make Jeffrey Epstein basically recoil in embarrassment. And that, and you'll know Donald Trump if you know that. You know what Disgusting. I mean? Disgusting. Yeah. L last last qu quick thing about Trump. Um, you know, is is the one answer, is the one word answer racism? Why, you know, you talk about how he wouldn't give the time of day to, you know, some guy in the, in the red state. You know what I mean? So many of the people who vote for him, so the QAnon people, whatever, right? He wouldn't give them the time of day yet you know he claims he's for the people is it people american people love racism like how yeah what is it it's racism you know he was he made it okay to be outwardly racist you know mm -hmm. the stuff that people had always said around their kitchen tables the kind of things i was talking about that i heard in high school you know mm -hmm. that the sort of white flight generation of americans that left the inner cities and moved mm -hmm. into the suburbs you know those were for the most part working class second and third generation mm -hmm. immigrants irish mm -hmm. you know italians the cops the firemen the construction guys yeah. you know when they got yeah. a leg up they all moved to the suburbs and a lot of them brought that inner city kind of tenement you know ghetto mentality i don't mean ghetto in the way it's co-opted yeah, but I, you know what i mean the proper terms of that you know where you'd have an irish neighborhood and a polish neighborhood and you sort of kind of all live side by side but didn't yeah. jive yeah. so that yeah. sort of like that sort of kind of kitchen table racism that was under, you know, that you would say around the kitchen table that you wouldn't say mm -hmm. in public. He sort of made it okay to be ethnocentric, jingoistic, yeah. and just outwardly racist, you know, right. and, and the, the, you know, the promise of white supremacy is, is riddled through all of that. And, mm -hmm. and to be fair, Trump didn't do this alone you know no, rupert no, murdoch no. did the heavy lifting he primed the pump for 15 years before yeah, trump yeah, could yeah. walk in and and be the hood ornament on the car of like injustice and insanity that he was but the racism is the appeal and i you know i've heard trump use the n-word he's definitely a racist but he's a racist in like the 50s new york kind of racist 60s mm. new york like puerto mm. ricans were the group that he hated the most mm. when i was around him because he's like a jet you know it's like west side story like he'd be railing on puerto ricans yeah. you're like it's yeah. not 1968 what are you right. talking about? you know right. what i mean right. but uh oh. so he's he is a new york kind of racist but yeah. not he wasn't he wasn't like the white hood kind of racist. I mean, his dad was in the KKK, as we all know, and went to the big rally at the garden and got arrested. But like he, he, I here's, Hey, let me put this another way. I think if, if you ask Trump, honestly, about most of these people that follow him, like the mm -hmm. QAnons and all this, he'd mm -hmm. be like, those people are out of their freaking minds, right. you know? And I know for a fact, he has more contempt for poor people, whether they're mm -hmm. white or black than he does, that mm -hmm. matters to him more than the color of your skin. Yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Because yeah. he would hang out with black people. He'd hang out with Mike Tyson. And, mm -hmm. you know, we had black people on The Apprentice. And he didn't want to pick them as the winner. You know, he didn't want yes. them working at his company. But mm -hmm. he wasn't like, I don't want them anywhere near me. He's a yeah. New Yorker. You know, yeah. anybody who grows up in New York is going to have a certain level of a cosmopolitan, you know, sure, attitude sure. towards race more than a guy in the you know hills of georgia or whatever you know was, did, was he was he doubly maybe was he doubly insulted that it was obama who you know yeah. insulted him would, yeah would, would he, he was a, would he have run if it wasn't for that you know people say that's the moment he decided to run you know when uh what's his name of uh course seth myers name. right uh -huh. seth myers made that joke which was a great joke and he was certainly humiliated in that that crowd that night. Mm -hmm. So that that definitely like set his resentment off. Mm -hmm. um, 
he was a Democrat when I worked for him, right? He was right. a Democrat in like 2000 and like up until 2008. And I believed he switched his registration in 2009 after, you know, after Obama won. Yeah, that was definitely, he was jealous of Obama. Yeah. You know, just like right now, I guarantee you, he's screaming at the TV all night, jealous of hell is Zelensky, right? Because mm. that's, you know, seeing somebody who's admired for their skills and talent that's earned, that they didn't come from anything, mm. like they made it on their own. That's something deep down he knew he could never achieve on his own. You know, he right. couldn't take a test on his own without his dad paying somebody. Jesus. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. So, and he knows that. Here's the thing about Donald Trump. And if you know anything about psychology, like nobody hates Donald Trump more than Donald Trump hates Ooh, Donald Trump deep yeah. down. You know, yeah, yeah. he knows he's a piece, piece of crap, you know, as a human being, you know, and he's never dealt with that. So he'd rather blow up the world than face that. And that's a dangerous mm. thing because Putin's take, the same way. All of us with us. Yeah. He's right. taking all of us with them. Right. Did, did you ever did you ever see any humanity in him? Did you ever have a moment where you you bonded over something or you saw him as like a human? Because like I said, he's just he's so odd. So weird. He's, you know, psychopath, sociopath. Did you ever no. see any humanity in him at all? No, not one no. time. Not one time, but I, you know, and I don't want to, I wasn't like in the limo with him and stuff, sure, you know, I'm on sure. sets with him and stuff, yeah, you know, yeah. I'm sure he could be, you know what, let's take that back. There's a friend of mine who's a colleague in TV whose father has known Donald Trump forever and whose father became pretty ill w within recent years, you know, within the last five or six years. And Donald would call and, and check on their wow. dad all the time. So <laughs> I guess he does have a heart, but he's also, well, I, I don't, you know, he also like cut off his own infant nephew's health insurance when that yes. nephew had cerebral palsy to yes. spite, you know, the, the brother's kids who were trying to get their fair share of an inheritance. Right. <laughs> so yeah. thank you. You know, think of that, you know, temper is humanity with that kind of action. Temper and he's a guy who beat up young girls for kicks that look like his daughter and, you know, sex trafficked people and Trump model management and all that kind of stuff. You know, yeah. is, is he going to, oh man, I, I just wonder, and you don't know the answer if he's ever going to find any sort of punishment for all the things he's done. God, no, dang. I don't think no, he is because he's, se he's 76 in June yeah. or something. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. He's already gotten away with it. Everybody's like, he's going to have a perp walk. Like, what are you talking about? Yeah. First of all, he's a former president. He's going to tie this up with lawyers. Even if you charge him, say, a year from now, mm -hmm. he's not going to trial for two, three years after that. They, right. You know, a good law firm can can tie stuff up in discovery forever. Mm -hmm. And at that point, he's almost 80 and a former yeah, president, yeah. like, no. And yeah, push yeah. comes to shove, he hops on a plane and goes to, you know, Saudi Arabia or United Emirates or, you know, whatever. All the orbs that he wants. All Exactly. The orbs. But he's not, <laughs> no one's going to get the orange. I don't mean to talk over you, but no, it's no, but people that are like, perp walks coming soon are freaking kidding themselves. I know, you know? I know. Sad, but true. I want to just wrap up by asking you about like the process of, of like writing comedy, like, you're obviously you're obviously very funny you can obviously you know freestyle if you will you can come off the top like i mean are you someone are you writing like every single word like you know you know parentheses insert laugh here or wait for pause here i i had a friend once who would take me when we lived in la you know like on a tuesday night to some little club in hollywood and i was like whoa dude will be up there with like a notepad he'd be like oh He'd, he'd throw out a joke. Oh, didn't work. Didn't land. You know, he'd be talking to the crowd, like total feedback, like workshop. Right. right. Yeah. I wonder how you work out your, your comedy. It's the same way, you know, yeah. it's written. That's, there's only one way to do it. You know, it's a lot of hard work and every word counts, you know, and, and you can only do it in, you only know if it works in front of an audience and it doesn't mm -hmm. always work the first time. So you got to give it a few run throughs and you realize, yeah, Oh, if yeah. I switch this word here, if I pause this, if I put this word at the end of the joke, it'll have a bigger punch. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just a process and you got to be in love with the process. Um, I, you know, my stuff is I do 70 minute sets now. I'm lucky I get to be, okay, I'm not it. a headliner on the national level like these big guys, but I'm not doing the showcase sets and clubs yeah. anymore just because yeah. I have a following and I have some man, you know, I, I play like city wineries and, and the theaters, small mm -hmm. theaters and stuff because people want to come hear me talk. So I have a bit of a built in, like people want to hear what I have to say about sure. politics. 
but it's all written out. It's written like a script. You know, I, as I said, I wasn't on stage for like a year during the mm -hmm. pandemic. I was doing this stuff, which is all off the top of my head. That yeah, kind of yeah, stuff yeah. is just like monologue, but jokes, you have to put in the work. It's like songs, right? You have to have craft. There's gotta be mm -hmm. chords. They have to be in the right sequence. The melody has to work on in harmony with the chords. Yeah. And, uh, I just, uh, it is rhythm. Rhythm yeah. is the most important thing, probably. The hardest thing to learn as a starting out comedian is pacing yourself and taking your time because you don't trust the material. You don't know that anybody's going to laugh. And and I remember I, I did this show that was the highlight of, of my career so far. And it was last <laughs> September at the Rams head in Annapolis, Maryland, which is this music club that I'd been at with like Stephen Stills and stuff as a you know, as a road oh, manager. Cool. And now I'm headlining this yeah. thing. You know, So it's like a big homecoming and I'm originally from Maryland. So I had this 70 minute set that I basically had to write out here in my backyard, doing it for frogs in my pond. Like I had no <laughs> feedback. I didn't, you know, I put some of my stuff that had worked in the past. It wasn't all new material, which is another trick you do is that you'll you put okay. new stuff next to old stuff. So you could give yourself a little confident uh, confidence on stage. Mm -hmm. You know, you do the new joke, you do the old joke kind of thing. So mm -hmm. you can at least find your bearings. But basically it was written out. You know, it was yeah, a written right. out like a script. You know, it's an hour, 70 minutes. That's like, you know, seven, 10 pages or Ooh. something. And all kinds of notes and all mm -hmm. kinds of words scratched out. And it mm -hmm. just takes a few months. It evolves, you know. So my last show in Boston this bit is here and this other bit is there. It's like live theater, you know, and, and my stuff is storytelling too. The second half mm -hmm. of my set is me talking about life on the road and, and not Trump, you know, right, it's about right. working with bands and art and music and social justice and all that kind of stuff. But uh, yeah, it, there's a lot of work involved and, and the setup punchline is where you're going to need craft the most. You know, there's a guy, Anthony Jeselnik, you know, Anthony mm -hmm. Jeselnik, great comedian yeah. who has his own style. You know, he, he studied literature, I think, or English at Tulane or something and wanted to be, a, you know, a normal writer and found he had skills as a comedic writer. And that's a guy where I, I see he's found his own voice, right? Because his mm -hmm. jokes are structured in a way that, especially as a comedian, you're like, well, I can see what this subject is. I can see what the obvious punchline is. And it's never obvious. He always mm -hmm. surprises me on the punchline, you know, and his whole shtick is that he makes it just like shocking, you know, and he's yeah, this yeah. mean guy, but he's clearly a, a really good writer. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, that's yeah. the thing I'm attracted to is, is the craft of it, you know, cause it's a lot of hard work and, uh, you know, it, it's hard to do. It's hard to do and, and make it meaningful. That's the other thing is that uh, like, you're so uh, desperate, you know, you sort of want to be like, you want people to laugh and you want to be seen as funny. And as a comedian, you have to get over that, you know, and a mm -hmm. lot of the comedians will tell you that, like, you have to get over needing the laughter and really focus on what you want to say, you know, and I left, I learned that from Steve Martin, who I left out at the beginning of our conversation. Uh -huh. He was the other big comedian in my childhood, you know, the yeah. King Tut, that was all <laughs> right when I was like a kid, you know, the jerk came out when I was like oh, 10. Classic it was just, movie. Right. One of my funniest memories, best Maybe. memories of childhood, right, was watching that. <laughs> so, and, and when I, when I started doing comedy, I was like, I got to take this seriously and study it. You know, it was like being back mm. in school. And I watched uh, something he did, like it was a master class or something on comedy and writing. Mm. And he said, like, do the material that other people aren't doing. And I find, you know, when you go to these clubs, it's very competitive and everybody's trying to get passed at the club so they can get mm. a paying slot or whatever. And a lot of the comedians these days, like the white guys in their 30s and 20s and stuff, they all sound the same. <laughs> they all have the same cadence. Mm. They all kind of talk about, the same stuff not all of them it's a generalization yeah. but i'll see a lot of patterns emerging they'll all dress this kind of same way you know it's all a nondescript t-shirt or whatever sure. i hate seeing that kind of stuff right because that's not punk rock man hey. that's not like you know you don't get fucking joe strummer out of doing that stuff uh -huh. you know what i mean yeah like get outside of the box and find your own voice and when you find your own voice, it'll all take off. And, and I don't have like a big career, or make a lot of money, but I know I have my own voice. You know yeah, what I mean? Do. People yeah, know what do. they know, what my point of view is, you know, and it, it's not, you know, it's based on like what I believe to be true. 
you know, mm-hmm. and, and what I want to point out in terms of hypocrisy and injustice, you know, and what I want, you know, to, to have people take home with them. Cause like, you know, and if you want, I'll send you a copy of one of my sets, you know, an hour set, if you ever want to watch it, cause you'll see it, it, it turns into a pretty heartfelt thing, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. And, yeah. and that's what, you know, I don't want to waste an opportunity that I have in this lifetime in front of an audience yeah telling dick jokes you know there's you know there's some profanity and stuff but you know what i'm saying like i want it to be a nutritious meal at some level you know i want it to be entertaining and frivolous and fun but i also i want it not to be empty calories if that makes any sense you know i mean behind every joke there's off there's a seat of truth right right absolutely like you have that you have that one you talk about when trump was working at the the pageants you said it's like giving him the pageant is like Given Jeffrey Dahmer a cooking show. I mean, you had to have laughed out loud the first time you wrote that. Yeah. Like, that was is, is there like a, is there like a watered down laugh? I mean, you talk about, you write it down, you revise, you revise. Like, is it, is it equally funny to you when you, when you, when you spit it out? Yeah. On stage? A line like that, you know, yeah. is a great line. The other yeah. one. And, and they come, as I said, I didn't have, I had that line originally in that mm-hmm. bit of like my stuff, but that thing evolved uh, it, later. Another good line that came from that was, uh, you know, whenever I saw those Trump boys, all I could think was, why couldn't they turn out more like the Menendez brothers? <laughs> I was like, that shit. Like, I couldn't wait uh, to get on stage and said that. And when I said it, you know, there's silence. And then people are like, oh, and, I, yeah, and then they laugh. And I was like, I'm just getting started, folks. <laughs> you know, that's when you know you're connecting with people, right? Yes. When it's hitting them viscerally. And they're like, should I even be laughing at this? This is outrageous, uh, you know, but it was truthful. You know, it was real. Well, well, you're obviously your comedy is is obviously hilarious. It's funny. It's also very important. I mean, you're talking about really important stuff, and there's that's that's the that's an important thing to, you know, thank to you. really be saying something like you talked about. So thanks for all your important work. Thanks for shining the light on this absolute hypocrisy and just crazy world we're in. And I'm sorry that you weren't that you and others weren't listened to more. You know, right? Yeah, Hopefully, thank you. maybe maybe it's not too late. And we don't get another 2024 and or like Trump light or whatever, right? I know. I, you know, I thought I was going to be able to retire all this stuff, you know, you know with Biden. I was like, I even sent out a tweet, like the morning of January 6th. I was like, this will be my last tweet about oh, Trump. I'm no. not even going to talk about this idiot, you know? Oh, and no. then by the afternoon, we all saw what happened. And it, but, and my role was like, I was like, oh, I've seen better security at a fish concert than they have. Right? The, you know. So you, you said, you said that, you said that Ivanka was the one who put him up to the Bible thing. Yeah, that was her idea because she wanted to like, you know, capitalize on his sort of leadership position because he'd been hiding, right? He'd been in the bunker and everything Mm -hmm. and the cities were on fire. And as you well know, she carried the Bible in her little purse across the street as they're tear gassing protesters. I'd really like to turn up the heat more on them because they're going to skate. You know, Ivanka has... You know, Jared's got no liability. He's not any part of the Trump organization. He's mm-hmm. never worked for him. He's not mentioned in any of this stuff. That kid is going to skate with all of this. And he hates the Trumps, too. He can't stand the Trumps. I'm sure he does. Yeah. It, wiser words have never been said. As you said, he'd blow up the world referring to Trump rather than get embarrassed. What uh, what do you got coming up? Tell us a little bit about some of your shows. Thank you, brother. Um, yeah, I'm doing the uh, the City Winery in New York on June seventh and then i'm going to be at the city winery loft in philadelphia on june 8th i got my podcast the noel castler podcast comes out every monday i got a website noelcastler.com doing my uh you know my twitter stuff i got a book project that i've been oh, working cool. on for about a year a lot of the stuff we just talked about you know yeah, kind yeah. of a memoir about my life and mm-hmm. a lot of the uh you know a lot of the musical journeys i took because you know the other thing is like not that I'm so interesting, but there's much more interesting stories in me mm-hmm. than the Trump stuff. You know, I worked with like really cool guys. I, I traveled the world with Crosby, Stills and Nash, you know, like, you know, Springsteen, like the Rolling Stones. Like I was at every live big TV event for like 20 years. You know, I saw Whitney Houston yeah. perform and Prince at the Super Bowl. Oh I did gosh, the Rock yeah. and Roll Hall of Fame stuff for 20 years, all the inductions. Mm-hmm. So you know, like Stephen Stills. I don't know if you know his work. Do you know Crosby, Stills, and Nash? I do. I do. Right. Yeah. 
you know, I used to run a teleprompter for him, you know, because he writes a lot of songs and he wrote them all when he was stoned, you know, 50 <laughs> years ago. So anybody would use a They all use teleprompters. But the first night I had to run the teleprompter for him, it was Helplessly Hoping, which is this beautiful song that we opened oh, yeah. with. And I was like rushing the thing, you know, we got on the tour bus afterwards and he goes, hey, pretty good for a first night, but I need you to slow it down. And I need you to find the poetry in my words, Ooh. right? Ooh. <laughs> and when he said that to me, I was like, we're going to get along good. Cause yeah. he's like, you know, that's what I want to do. I want to find the poetry in life. You know, you, you want to find what people are trying to say and help them say it. And, and we can all do that. We need more voices. We need more diversity, sure, you know, sure. and, and we need to share what we've learned along the way with others, you know, so, so we can come to a world that, is not insane. It's not in fi on fire. There's not people yeah. dropping bombs on theaters full of children as happened mm -hmm. today. You know, this yeah. is coming out later, but okay. you know, we're watching a World War II again, kind of, you know what I'm saying? We're watching yeah. human, you know, we're watching the stuff that- We don't, you know, learn, from, we, we don't learn from history. Right. We, we, exactly, we all the stuff, exactly. You said it better than me, you know? On a, on a much lighter note, did, if, if I go onto eBay, am I gonna find that Springsteen towel for sale? Oh my God. How did you get all this information? I heard you you're talking about that in one, one other podcast. Yeah. So that, you haven't put that up for sale, right? No, I don't even think yet. I kept it. I kept <laughs> a lot of pics. I kept backstage passes, but yeah, I'd have to go clean up his dressing room every night. And my buddy, Joey, who I just talked to today, who did it with me and Joey and I would have to pack up Clarence and Clarence Clemens had a oh, sticker. Yeah. He had like a, a bike that he mm -hmm. would ride to warm up on stage. This is 20 years ago. You know, it was like Clarence Clemens was huge. He was like football player, like seven feet tall, kind of 300 pound guy. And it was this massive stairmaster. And me and my buddy had to like put it in this road case. And then after Bruce left the show, I'd have to go clean up his dressing room. And like you said, I'd pick up a, a towel and they'd be like covered in like Jersey guy pubic hairs. You know? <laughs> and I'd be like, I'll bet these people would buy this shit. Like they're I'll bet there's somebody, way. you know what I mean? Shoot. Um, and the last question for you, did, uh, did Jackson Brown read your treatise on Central American imperialism? He never read it. You know, ah. I told him about it. I told him about it. And he was just impressed that this sort of weird kid, you know, because I think what impressed him was that I didn't want to talk about music. I wanted to talk about politics and how mm -hmm. his music had made me go kind of learn from myself and try to educate other kids. And it's funny because like, and he was my hero since I was five. He was just like my, you know, favorite songwriter, singer and stuff. So we had those interactions. And then I kind of went into my career in my early 20s and I would go see concerts, but I sort of lost touch with him. And, I, you know, I was doing the VMAs and all these kind of shows that like Jackson Brown wasn't at, you know, sure, let's face sure, it. He sure. wasn't like, you know, I was in the boy <laughs> band era and Britney Spears and working with all these folks forever. And then when I was like 35, right? So you know, 15, 16, 17 years after I first met him, he was being inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall. I'm not the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He was already in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame where I was there then too, but he was doing the Songwriters Hall of Fame, okay. which is a show okay. in New York that I did every year. It's still, it's happening again this year. And it was like an inside baseball music industry award show, like a really uh, cool award show, yeah, you know? Yeah where they'd bring Broadway composers and Brill building guys in and stuff like the real deal, you know, like the craft, and, the craft, right? Exactly. Yeah. Real stuff, you know? So mm -hmm. it was my, it's still my favorite show to ever work on. And uh, my buddy, actually, Joey, who I was just talking about with Springsteen, you know, the other thing is it's a small world in live TV. Sounds so you'll like work with like the it. same people your whole career on every show and uh, or most every show. And uh, my buddy calls me up the day before he goes, Hey, don't you like that Jackson Brown guy? And I said, yeah, I love him. What are you talking about? He said, he's on the show tomorrow. I've assigned you to him. Nice. So I'm like, oh my God. So I go down, we, sh we did this show at the, the Marriott Marquis, which is in the middle of Times Square. And I went down to meet him on the street, you know, when the SUV dropped him off for rehearsal or whatever. And I'm like, hey, Jackson, I'm Noel. I'm here to bring you up to sound check. And he goes, aren't you the kid with the paper? Whoa. And I go, yeah. He goes, you know what? That's the best example I still have of one of my songs really changing somebody's life. I'm going to talk about you in my speech tonight. And I'm like, oh, my God, you know, and then I met his management and stuff. And I did such a good job taking care of him 
because he's an like, idol and I did my job well anyway, that at the end of the night, they were like, hey, do you have a passport? And I was like, yeah. And they're like, we want to start hiring you. Next thing I knew, I was Whoa. his road manager on a plane heading to London with him. <laughs> and I ended up doing like two tours as his road manager. And then Graham Nash stole me from Jackson. They had the same management. Okay. And Graham was like, you want to come work for us? And I was like, hell yeah, that's even better. Crosby stills mm-hmm. and Nash, you know? <laughs> You guys knew the Beatles, you know? Wow. And then I I traveled the world with those cats for like six, seven years, you know, hopping on a plane, flying to Japan, flying to wherever. And the best thing I learned from those guys, because they were all like, you know, they were kind of like uncles, you know, they were like hippie uncle guys, is that they always were creative. Jackson, Graham, these guys were always writing. David Crosby would come borrow my guitar if he didn't have one in the hotel and write a song on it, you know? It was about the craft, you know, when you get behind the curtain, so to speak, the guys that have longevity, they're always putting in the work, you know, they're not resting on their laurels, they're putting in the work. And that was what I took away from it the most is that like the only thing you can control is like the ability you have to create and forget Mm -hmm. about all the insanity and the popularity around you. Mm -hmm. Just keep doing what you love and the rest will fall into place and it's up and down and peaks and valleys, but you know, just keep writing, man. You know, as Jimmy Buffett told me a page a day, bro, just write a page a day at the end of 30 days, you got 30 pages. Herman woke told me that (laughs) you are. Well, you're the embodiment of that. That's so awesome. I, I mean, okay, being on, you know, being on a worldwide tour with these legends, these titans of rock, or balance that with, you know, um, putting Trump into his girdle. I mean, which one's better though, right? Right, exactly. I mean, I know. hard to I tell. Know. Exactly. <laughs> I, I just wish you such great luck in the future and, and really appreciate your time. And I thank you so much. Thanks, Peter, man. What a pleasure. Went by quick. I'm sorry I talk so much. I speak in paragraphs. That, as that's what talk. I got you on here for. You are, you are the man. Right on, brother. What a pleasure it's been to speak with Noel Kassler on episode 116. Please check out also his car rants. Is that that's via your Twitter account? Is that right? Yeah, they come out every yeah. Friday at 930. Those, those are awesome. You can now subscribe to the Chills of Will podcast on Apple. Leave a five-star review. You can also ask for it by name using Alexa. Find it on Stitcher, Spotify, and if we want to give money to that Bezos guy, Amazon Music. Follow me on Instagram where I'm at Chills at Will Podcast or on Twitter where I'm at Chills at Will PO1. You can watch this and other episodes on my YouTube channel called the Chills at Will Podcast channel. This is a passion project of mine, a DIY operation. And I'd love for your help in promoting what I'm convinced is a unique and spirited look at an often ignored art form. The intro song for the podcast is Wind Down Instrumental. And the other song played is Hoops Instrumental by Matt Whitehour. Both songs are used through archesaudio.com. Please tune in for episode 117 with Nadia Owusu, who's a Ghanaian and Armenian-American writer and memoirist. Her debut memoir, Aftershocks, was selected as a best book of 2021 by Time, Esquire, and many others. It was also one of President Obama's favorite books of the year. The episode will air on April 5th. For now, thanks again for listening. I hope that these quarantine days bring you texts by writers with mad skills like Noel Kassler, whose material gives you laughs and chills at will.